In the last lecture, I derived the Schwarzschild metric So that's ds squared equals minus 1 minus 2m over r dt squared plus 1 divided by 1 minus 2m over r dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. And this is a solution of the vacuum Einstein equation. where by vacuum we mean the stress-energy-momentum tensor vanishes. If we let our space-time be described by this metric for all values of little r, that is for all values of the aerial radius, then this is a spherical black hole of mass m. Now, one question people often have is the following. If this represents an object of mass m, a black hole, then how can that be since we solved the vacuum Einstein equations? Vacuum means t mu nu equals zero, so there are no matter fields anywhere. So how, how can there be mass? Or said another way, where is the mass in this space-time? The answer is that we're too used to thinking of mass as a property that only material particles can have. But remember, in relativity, mass is the same thing physically as energy, and fields can have energy. For example, the electromagnetic field can carry energy, and therefore it can have mass. And also the gravitational field itself can have energy associated with it, or mass. And that's what's happening here. The black hole, the mass, is just a, a property of the space-time itself. And recall how we define M. We define it using a Kepler-type experiment where we release a particle or a satellite at large R and measure its period and relate that to the mass M. So um, the measurement or the identification of the mass has nothing to do with the presence of any material particles. Now sometimes you'll hear someone say that the mass of a black hole is all concentrated at the singularity and there may be some sense in which that's correct, but uh, it leads you to view the mass as being concentrated at a physical location inside the black hole, in, in the physical center. And that's not the right point of view. It, the singularity is actually not a location in space. It's a set of events in the future. So instead of saying, where is the mass, we should be asking, when is the mass? But now I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself in talking about the singularity. In order to understand these statements, we need to go back and examine carefully the causal structure of the space-time described by this Schwarzschild metric. Let me begin by making a few simple observations. We're considering the space-time described by this metric for all values of the aerial radius little r. So we need to worry about what happens when little r is equal to either 2m or 0. When r equals 2m, this metric component vanishes, while this metric component goes to infinity. And when r is equal to 0, this component goes to infinity and this component vanishes. So what is happening? At r equals 0 and r equal 2m. The first thing we need to understand is that just because some metric components are going to zero or infinity, this does not imply that there's anything strange or abnormal about the geometry. So for example, Let's just consider 
flat space in two dimensions using polar coordinates. All right, the metric is dr squared plus r squared d theta squared. And here we have a metric component. The theta theta component goes to zero at one point, namely when r is equal to zero. That doesn't mean there's any, anything strange or abnormal about the geometry at that point. What it's really telling us is that we have a bad coordinate system. So if you draw the coordinate lines, the r equal constant lines and the theta equal constant lines, all of these radial coordinate lines converge at the origin. So what that means is this point has multiple coordinate labels. So r theta could be 0 pi over 2, or it could be 0 minus 3 pi over 4, and so forth. So there's a breakdown between the one-to-one -one correspondence between pairs of uh, sets of coordinate labels and points in the space. In this sense, polar coordinates are bad coordinates, and that shows up in the vanishing of this metric component. So let me give you another example. Let's let r equal 1 over rho. So we're defining a new radial coordinate rho. And dr is minus 1 over rho squared d rho. So the metric in these coordinates is ds squared equals 1 over rho to the fourth power d rho squared plus 1 over rho squared d theta squared. Now in these coordinates, these metric components blow up at rho equals zero. But again, that's not a reflection of anything funny or abnormal about this, the geometry. It's just a reflection of a, our choice of coordinates. In fact, we can convince ourselves that there's nothing wrong with the geometry described by either of these metrics by computing the curvature tensor. And if we did that, we would find the curvature is zero. After all, this both of these metrics just describe a flat two-dimensional plane. So the real test for anything strange going on with the geometry is to compute the curvature, the Riemann curvature. R mu nu alpha beta. And in this example, we would just find that's equal to zero, which implies the geometry is flat. So let's do the same thing for short shield. Let's compute the curvature. When we do that, we find that the Riemann tensor has components like r, t, r, t, r equals minus 2m divided by r squared times 2m minus r and so forth. Now in this case, with the short shield space-time, we need to go a step beyond what we did for the flat space case where the Riemann tensor was just zero. We need to compute uh, curvature invariance. In other words, we need to compute things that don't depend on the coordinate system at all. So we need to compute scalar quantities. Scalars are, are uh, functions that have a particular value at each point in the space-time, and their value doesn't depend on the coordinate system being used. So, for example, we can compute the square of the Riemann tensor, r mu nu sigma rho, r mu nu sigma rho. This is a scalar, and its value is equal to 48 m squared over r to the sixth. Now there's another way that we can construct invariant quantities, and that is to introduce an orthonormal basis. So for example, let's introduce basis vectors ET with components um, 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus 2m over r, comma 0, comma 0, comma 0, and another basis vector ER with components 0, comma, 
square root of 1 minus 2m over r comma 0 comma 0. And you can check that each of these basis vectors is normalized. The ET basis vectors are normalized to minus 1 and the ER basis vectors are normalized to 1. And now we can compute the scalar quantity r mu nu alpha beta e sub t mu e sub r nu e sub t alpha e sub r beta. And this is equal to minus 2m over r cubed. And we can go on to construct other uh, curvature invariants, quantities that are scalars built out of the curvature tensor. And in every case, what we find is a similar result. Namely, the curvature invariants are well defined at r equal 2m, but blow up to infinity at r equals 0. So for short shield, the curvature is just fine. It's finite at r equal 2m, but it's infinite at r equals 0. So the fact that the GTT component of the metric goes to 0 at r equal 2m and the GRR component blows up at r equal 2m, that's just a result of the coordinate system we've chosen. Um, on the other hand, r equal 2m does have a special global meaning and that is it's, it's the boundary that divides space-time into two regions, an in interior and an exterior region, with the difference being that light rays in, in the interior region can never reach infinity, can never reach asymptotic infinity where r is infinite. So r equal 2m is referred to as the event horizon. And r equal 0 is referred to as the singularity. The curvature blows up at the singularity and there's nothing we can do about that. That has nothing to do with coordinates. So uh, a change of coordinates can't change the geometry or the property of the space-time, but it, different sets of coordinates can be useful for understanding different features of the space-time. So what I'd like to do now is to change from the Schwarzschild coordinates, in particular from the Schwarzschild time coordinate, to a new time coordinate called the Kerr-Shield time. So let me just remind you in Schwarzschild coordinates, the Schwarzschild geometry is minus 1 minus 2m over r dt squared plus 1 divided by 1 minus 2m over r dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. And now we'll introduce the Kerr shield time. And I'll just put a little subscript KS here for Kerr shield. It's related to the short shield time coordinate T by Kerr shield time equals short shield time plus 2m times the natural log of absolute value of r over 2m minus 1. Then dt Kerr shield is equal to dt short shield plus 1 divided by r over 2m minus 1 times dr. And we can of course solve this for dt and then plug that into here to find the following result for the metric. ds squared equals minus 1 minus 2m over r times dt squared which is dt Kerr shield minus 1 over r over 2m minus 1 dr, all of that squared, plus this term, 1 minus 2m over r dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. Now we multiply this out. We have minus 1 minus 2m over r dt Kerr shield squared. Then there's a cross term here. That will be plus 1 minus 2m over r and then divided by r over 2m minus 1 
times a factor of 2, dt cur shield dr, and then the term coming from squaring this term, we have minus 1 minus 2m over r times 1 divided by r over 2m minus 1 quantity squared. And we also have another term that's proportional to dr squared. That's plus 1 over 1 minus 2m over r. All of that times dr squared. And then finally we have this term r squared d omega squared. Now there are a few more steps of algebra to go through to simplify this, and I won't go through it in detail, but let me just write down the answer. And while I, when I do that, let me change notation. Instead of calling the new time coordinate uh, with a sub ks, let me just drop the ks and just call that t. So we'll understand that t is now the Kerr shield time. The result is minus 1 minus 2m over r dt squared, that's Kerr shield time squared, plus 4m over r dt dr plus 1 plus 2m over r dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. So this is the metric for a Schwarzschild shield black hole written in terms of the Kerr shield time coordinate. This Kerr shield coordinate system has some nice properties in common with our original short shield coordinate system. For example, r is the aerial radius. So r measures the area of the spheres that are defined by the rotational symmetry of the space-time and represented by this part of the metric. So the area is 4 pi r squared. The other property it has is that the killing vector field is d by dt. You can see because the metric components in these coordinates are t-independent. This might seem surprising that d by dt is the killing vector field because d by dt was also the killing vector field when we were using our original short shield coordinates. Let me remind you of the relationship between the short shield coordinate, which here is called t, and the new time coordinate. Here it's called t sub ks. This transformation doesn't actually change the t coordinate lines. In other words, the lines of constant r, theta, and phi. What it does is it changes the t equal constant surfaces. So let me draw a picture. These are the t equal constant curves or surfaces in the original Schwarzschild coordinates. And these are the integral curves of the killing vector field. So that's d by dt Schwarzschild, but it's also d by dt Kerr shield. And now the t equal constant surfaces in the Kerr shield coordinate system look like this. So these are t Kerr shield equal constant. And in both cases we're carrying the spatial coordinates, the r theta phi coordinates, along the uh, integral curves of the killing vector field. In this case though with Kerr shield coordinates the t equal constant surfaces are not orthogonal to the killing vector field. Our next task will be to investigate the causal structure of the black hole And we do this by examining the light cones. So we need to compute the null directions. So let's consider a radial curve. That's some curve t of lambda, r of lambda, theta of lambda equal to a constant, and phi of lambda equal to a constant. 
Now we want this curve to be null, so we want ds squared to be zero along the curve, but ds squared is minus one minus two m over r dt squared plus four m over r dt dr plus one plus two m over r dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. And now if we plug this into the line element, we have minus one minus two m over r of lambda times t dot squared times d lambda squared, but since it's equal to zero, I'll drop the d lambda squared, plus four m over r t dot r dot plus one plus two m over r r dot squared, and d omega squared is zero because theta and phi are constants. Now this can be rewritten as minus t dot squared plus r dot squared, that takes care of this one and this one, plus 2m over r times t dot squared plus r dot squared plus 2 times t dot r dot. So these first terms are t dot plus r dot times t dot minus r dot, and these next terms can be written as 2m over r times t dot plus r dot quantity squared. So now we can factor out the factor of t dot plus r dot. That's times um, minus t dot minus r dot, so let's just write that as r dot minus t dot, plus the rem remainder here is 2m over r times r dot plus t dot. Now we're looking for all the ways in which this expression can equal zero. So one way for this to equal zero is for t dot plus r dot to equal zero. And this of course tells us that t dot equals minus r dot, and we can now integrate this to find that t equals minus r plus a constant. Now another way that this expression can equal zero is for r to equal 2m, a constant. So if r is equal to 2m, then r dot is zero here and here, and um, 2m over r is just one, so the minus t dot cancels the plus t dot, and this whole expression in square brackets is zero. Now the final set of null directions comes from setting the factor in square brackets equal to zero for r not equal to 2m. So for r not equal to 2m, we set this equal to zero, and we have r dot plus 2m over r times r dot, that's this term and this term. Let's bring the t dot terms to the other side. We have t dot minus 2m over r times t dot. Now we can rearrange this as Let's write this term on the left. This is t dot times 1 minus 2m over r equals r dot times 1 plus 2m over r. And now we'll divide by this factor to obtain t dot equals 1 plus 2m over r times r dot divided by 1 minus 2m over r. Now this can be integrated. The solution is t equals r plus 4m times the natural log of absolute value of r minus 2m plus a constant. So these are all the radial null curves in the black hole spacetime, and we can plot them in a TR diagram. That's what I've done here. So in this diagram, the vertical axis is the t-axis, horizontal axis is the r-axis. So keep in mind, each point in this diagram represents a two-dimensional sphere of aerial radius little r. Now the straight lines in this diagram are the null directions t equals minus r plus constant. And these curves that fan outward 
here and inward here are the curves t equals r plus 4m times natural log of absolute value r minus 2m plus constant. The remaining null curve in this diagram is r equal 2m. Now r equal 2m is of course the black hole horizon. So it's represented by this heavy black line in the diagram. And r equals zero is the singularity. So I'm going to put a little squiggle line along r equals zero to remind ourselves that the curvature is uh, singular there. Now let's sketch some of the light cones. So for an event, say an event right here, these are the future null rays. So the light cone looks something like this. For an event here, we have, here's the light cone and so forth. For this event, and you'll notice as we get closer and closer to the horizon 2M, the light cones are becoming more and more tipped to the left towards small values of R. Inside the horizon, here's a light cone, and so forth. Now the horizon itself, 2M, is a null a null curve. So here's a light cone that sits right at the horizon. Here's another one. Let me draw one more light cone outside the horizon, say right here. Now keep in mind that the light cones represent the causal future of events. So nothing can travel faster than light, so any material particle or observer must follow along a time-like curve that stays inside the light cone. So for example, here's an observer, a observer's world line always staying inside the light cone at each event. And notice this observer is staying outside the black hole, outside referring to the region R greater than 2M. The interior or inside of the black hole is R less than 2M. Now let's draw the world line of an observer who crosses the horizon. So this is a time-like world line, so it always stays within the light cone at any given point. Let's say the observer crosses the horizon right here at this event. The observer must stay inside the light cone, and you can see because the light cones are all tipped towards the singularity, this observer has no choice but to continue moving to smaller and smaller r until they hit the singularity at r equals zero. We can see what's happening more clearly in the lower part of the diagram. Let's say we have an observer who reaches this event right here. That observer has no choice but to move within the light cone. So that observer must remain between this null curve and this null curve. So that means the observer is going to hit the singularity somewhere in this region. And no amount of force, no amount of acceleration can change that because this is really the future for this observer. So just keep in mind that this t-coordinate is merely a coordinate. It has no physical meaning. Okay, in particular, we shouldn't think of time as running up in this diagram. In fact, for any observer in the interior of the black hole, time is moving to the left towards the singularity. And the singularity uh, you can see is not a location in space, it's actually a future time. It's not a place or location in space. And this is why it can't be avoided. It's the future for any observer or any particle. 
that crosses the horizon into the interior of the black hole. So this diagram, I think, is a, a good way to understand the causal structure of a black hole and the origin of the familiar statement that nothing can escape from a black hole, not even light. You can see in this diagram that even all of the light rays are eventually drug into the singularity and no light rays escape across the horizon at 2M. Let me comment on one last feature of a black hole that people sometimes find confusing. Here we have a particle that's falling into the black hole across the horizon, and here we have an observer on the outside, so let's pretend the particle is glowing, it's giving off light, and these are some of the light rays of the, uh, that pass from the particle to the observer. So when the particle, so this is the light that's released from the particle at this event and received by the observer at this event. Here's the light that's emitted at this event and received at this event and so forth. And you can see that what's happening is that as the particle moves closer and closer to the horizon, um, the light received by the observer is getting more and more spread out. So that's as, as these light rays, these null rays, become more bunched up close to the horizon. They take longer and longer to escape out to the observer near infinity. And in the limit, as the particle approaches the horizon, it takes infinitely long amount of time for, from the point of view of the observer for these light rays to reach the observer. So the observer never actually sees the particle cross the horizon. In fact, uh, the event at which the particle reaches the horizon, light released from that event just travels along the horizon. It never escapes out to infinity, out to where the observer can see it. So, although the observer never sees the particle cross the horizon, uh, it's not the case that the observer sees the particle just hover above the horizon. What happens is these light rays are becoming more and more spread out as the particle approaches the horizon, and that means they're becoming more and more redshifted. So we can think of these light rays as representing the world lines of the peaks and troughs of a light wave, and they're becoming more and more spread out, which means the light is becoming more and more redshifted. So no matter how sensitive the observer's equipment might be, there comes a point in time when the observer can no longer see the particle because the light has redshifted below the threshold of the instruments. So what the observer sees is the particle just fade into blackness as part of the black hole. So the statement that an outside observer will never see a particle cross the horizon is technically correct, but misleading. A particle certainly can cross the horizon of a black hole, and of course, once it does, it has to hit the singularity. And we can even calculate the time it takes the particle to move from the horizon to the singularity. It's not too difficult of a calculation. I think I'll save the details for a practice problem. But just let me quote some of the results. If we have a particle that falls freely, so in other words, along a geodesic, and we'll make it a radial geodesic, starting from infinity, and it falls through the horizon and into the singularity, the time it takes from the horizon to the singularity, of course, depends on how big the black hole is. For a black hole of mass, one solar mass, the mass of the sun, the time is approximately 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. So about 6.6 .6 microseconds. That's very fast on a human time scale. For a large black hole, the time scale can be much longer. For example, we can consider the black hole at the center of the galaxy M87. And this was recently imaged. by the Event Horizon Telescope. This black hole has a mass of about 6.5 billion solar masses. And the time it would take a particle to fall from the uh, event horizon of this black hole to the singularity is about 11 hours.